uh, safety today. Um, and I couldn't think of a better place to talk about safety than Fort McMurray. Um, I'm sure uh, those of you involved in the oil industry deal with that every day. Uh, and often, uh, the safety procedures that you learn and the safety culture you develop uh, during the training makes a difference between life and death. And uh, I am in a different industry. I am a surgeon. Uh, and uh, it's not much different. In surgery, safety makes a difference between life and death. Um, often, uh, in, um, um, when we um, get to work, we um, um, see different patients and we are involved in uh, a number of uh, um, critical uh, decisions. I often, with my hands uh, and my decisions, uh, can impact the life of my patients. And the way I teach uh, my uh, younger colleagues and the way I practice, I impact uh, their practice and they impact their patients. So um, the stakes are very high um, and uh, the responsibility is huge. And I think about it every morning when I drive to work, believe me. In order to be a successful surgeon, um, it takes, it's a long journey. And uh, in order to be successful, you need to be confident. And uh, often, we feel that we have to be perfect. In order to get into medical school, you have to be uh, perfect. You have to have perfect grades. In order to get into a residency program, uh, you have to be perfect in medical school. Uh, you have to be perfect in the residency program uh, to get a job. And then there is this constant expectation from our patients that uh, we are perfect. And somewhere in uh, this journey, we start believing that we are perfect. Uh, and then we experience our first error, uh, our first complication, uh, the first disaster, and uh, we have to face the patients and we have to face their families. And uh, that's where we start asking ourselves. Uh, I clearly remember this uh, moment. I will never forget it. And I will actually never forget any of the errors I've made through my career. Um, and then I start asking myself, and we start asking ourselves, uh, Am I good enough? Do I have the talent? Did I make the right decisions? Was I a good enough leader uh, for my team uh, so that they could be the best as, uh, as they could? And um, most importantly, what did I learn here? How do I ensure that this doesn't happen again? Um, and um, um, I spent 10 years training to become the surgeon I am now. And during, in this period, I did a lot of procedures and uh, often my teachers told me at the end of the day, you did a great job, uh, you are a great surgeon and uh, it felt good. Uh, then I went uh, home and I thought about it and uh, I thought this kind of feedback uh, is useless, meaningless. I don't get better by getting this type of feedback. I want to know what I did wrong, how can I improve? So I started videotaping my procedures and uh, um, at the end of the day, I felt amazing. But when I watched the videotape a couple of days later, there was a huge discrepancy that was shocking. Uh, the perception I had at the end of the, uh, well, I was in the action or at the end of the day was that I did a great job. But when I watched it a couple of days later, it was totally different. I could see so many things I could do better. I could see um, uh, that there are so many areas that I could improve on. So um, um, I think, uh, this is something that learned me, or t taught me that I have to uh, work to help myself and help my colleagues identify their errors and identify uh, what we can do better, because that's the only way uh, we can improve. So um, surgeons are obviously not uh, pilots and athletes, but these industries have developed an amazing uh, culture of safety and culture of quality improvement. That's how. Tiger Woods and uh, Rory McIlroy keep improving their swings and how that's how airlines keep improving their safety records. Uh, and uh, the uh, companies, uh, the aircraft uh, uh, um, manufacturers keep making safer and safer aircrafts. But in surgery, we have a problem. In surgery, once we graduate from a residency program, we start practicing and we're an, on our own. Nobody watches us, nobody gives us feedback, nobody tells us what uh, we've done wrong and, what, and how we can improve. And these are some facts that uh, could be shocking for many. 
Uh, there are more than 200 million operations worldwide every year. And uh, between 3 and 17% of these operations end with major complications. In Canada, between 9 and 25,000 people die each year as a result of medical errors. In the US, this, is, this number is more than 200,000. 40% of these errors happen in the operating room and 50% of them are avoidable. If we compare this with aviation, there are 50,000 flights every day um, and only 440 fatalities in 2011. So how do we get there? And this is a thought that has been keeping me busy. How do we improve our safety director how, how, uh, record? How do we make our operating room safer for our patients? So um, I went uh, and started exploring what uh, safety culture is in aviation. And uh, we're very thankful to Air Canada. They opened the doors uh, to their uh, corporate safety program. And uh, we learned a lot from them. First of all, we learned that black box doesn't equal a, dis a disaster. Uh, we learned that uh, almost every large aircraft is equipped with a secondary black box. And this is not the orange box that we all know from the air accident investigations. This is a box that collects thousands of parameters per second. Um, and uh, it generates a tremendous amount of data that's used to assess risks, that's used to analyze uh, performance, and most importantly, uh, improve uh, performance of the crew and mitigate all these risks. And that's how they've achieved this amazing safety record. Uh, while in surgery we have a totally different environment and totally different culture, still the operating theaters are the most secretive environments. Uh, we still don't understand how our performance impacts our patient outcomes. There are thousands of paper published, papers published there uh, discussing what are the risk factors for adverse event. And they look at patient-related factors or equipment-related factors, uh, time of the day, and a lot of different parameters, but never looking at our own performance. One of the most import important factors for, uh, to ensure a safe outcome or adverse outcome uh, is the surgeon. This is us. So uh, without this type of information, we have very limited opportunities to understand our, our performance. And if we don't understand our own performance, we have absolutely no chance of improving it. Um, and surgeons are human. We make errors. And errors are in indeed inevitable as long as humans are involved. And uh, usually, though, a single simple error doesn't result in an adverse uh, event. There, there are usually a number of uh, factors we call chain of events that will lead to an adverse outcome. And we, quite frankly, don't understand this process in surgery. Uh, we look back if there is some disaster that has happened and uh, try to remember what really, what really happened, what led to this adverse outcome. But that's not always easy. And this is a reactive safety measure. We need to change this to be more proactive. And with time, we develop a protective mechanism where we deny or ignore or forget and repeat. And this is not acceptable. This needs to change. So that's why we decided to adopt some of the concepts in aviation that has made it such a safe industry and has been so successful uh, for aviation. And that's the, 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 the black box concept. We call it the operating room black box. And with that, we collect a lot of information from practically everything that's happening in the operating room. We record a video of the procedure. We record the video of the room. Uh, we have uh, voice recorders, uh, and we collect a lot of software data from all the devices we use in the operating room. We also monitor uh, the, uh, the physiological state of our patients with their heart rate and blood pressure and so on, a lot of other parameters. And it, we uh, mix it, synchronize it into a file that uh, allows us to evaluate it later. And with this information, when we evaluate it critically, we can understand what is important in the operating room? What, is, what are the risks that may result in adverse outcomes? And most importantly, how can we prevent that in the future? Uh, these are some of the, uh, the performance parameters we measure. We measure what, procedures, what, what procedural steps were done during the surgery, how many technical errors the surgeon or the team made, what adverse events happened during the surgery, how did the team communicate, what was the leadership uh, uh, the situational awareness, and a lot of other non-technical 
uh, performance parameters. We measure the structure in the operating room, how many people were there, why were they there, um, the temperature uh, in the room, the decibel level, a lot of, ev uh, of, of parameters that help us reconstruct the environment later on. And uh, we started with a simple study. We wanted to kind of understand how do we do. Uh, and uh, and our, our pilot study involved 54 procedures. And um, shocking for many of us, and also shocking for others. Uh, in 38 of these uh, 54 procedures, we noticed adverse events. 66 in total in these 54 procedures. The most shocking part of this was, though, that 75% of these adverse events were not noticed by the entire team member. And we asked them uh, at the end of the procedure. So a couple of minutes or five minutes after the procedure, already 75% of us had forgotten about it. So you can imagine what tremendous loss of information this is. And this is such a useful information, the only information that can help us improve. And we just let it go. Um, we wanted to test the concept of deliberate practice. And deliberate practice is a concept that was uh, introduced in professional sports and music uh, by a psychologist in, uh, in Florida. And basically the concept suggests that uh, we don't need to train everything. We just need to focus on our deficiencies and make sure that we uh, avoid them and we develop intervention or training interventions to avoid these deficiencies. Um, it worked very well for professional athletes. It worked very well for musicians. So we thought it will probably work for surgeons using the data we already record with the operating room black box. And uh, as Vince Lombardi said, uh, practice in itself doesn't make perfect. It's the perfect practice that makes perfect. And this information allows us to design perfect practice interventions. So this is how the study uh, looks like. We uh, involved a number of uh, residents from our program. Uh, we randomized them in two groups. One group uh, that went through the conventional practice. They did all the training that every surgical resident in uh, Canada goes through. Uh, the other went through, uh, were randomized to the, deli the deliberate practice group. And we wanted to see how they perform in the operating room on real patients. The first group did a, a simple, uh, minimally invasive procedure on real patients, then they get the usual training, uh, and then did another procedure. While the intervention group, the deliberate practice group, uh, their performance was recorded, it was analyzed, they received feedback, their deficiencies were pointed to them, and we designed training interventions to uh, uh, address the specific deficiencies, and they were different for different surgeons. And then they did another uh, procedure in the operating room on real patients. So this is how the results uh, look like. Um, you can see on the left, there was no difference in the performance between the two groups uh, during the first procedure. But during the second procedure, after the intervention, there was a dramatic difference. The group that went through the deliberate practice program, the group that uh, whose performance was recorded, analyzed, they received feedback, and they got specific training to address their deficiencies, improved dramatically. So this showed us that uh, we can eliminate the learning curves in the operating room, the learning curves on real patients. Um, so this concept uh, is really simple. It uh, starts with admitting uh, that we make errors. These errors uh, through chain of events may result to adverse out outcomes. And uh, we need to identify these errors. We need to create a system where these errors are identified and analyzed. And then we create awareness among us uh, and our trainees, and we create better training curricula based on our performance uh, to uh, uh, understand the errors and understand the chain of events and break this chain of events. And this is not easy, uh, and this will only work if we start with changing the culture, the safety culture in surgery. And it starts with admitting that we are humans and we are not perfect, and we all make errors. And we have to accept that. What's not acceptable is to cause harm twice because of the same preventable error. We have to remember that. Thank you. Thank you.